Let us say the 150th Psalm. I think we, we know it, and the reason I think we know it is because we have sung it a number of times. <clears throat> Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Now what are we going to do? All right, let's praise him. Praise the name of the Lord. We praise thee, O Lord. We magnify thee. We glorify thy name. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing that chorus. Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the... I, I didn't anticipate this, but last night we heard the, how's her name? Denuba and her husband do something like this. It was the most remarkable experience. She was a, what was she, an anti-bride. Anti That's what she called herself, anti-bride. She was a fast liver. She drove a Porsche car. They cost about 25 cents, <coughs> sports car. She was on radio, TV. She was a big person. That's why they got her to, when she found the Lord. And that awful man, that dreadful man, what was his name? No, not Kai, the, the preacher. Harold Bredesen. He is terrible. We've had him in this city twice. I've met with him quite a few times. He knows how to stick his nose in other people's business. And, and he's the most unassuming. I said to him at one conference on the West Coast, I think I heard his feeling. I said, now I know what the Bible means by using the foolish things to confound the wise. Man, he says, I've got a degree in an art degree. I've got a degree in theology. Of course, I know that. I mean, I've known him for years. In fact, he said he learned to sing in the spirit in my meetings in 1950 in Detroit. So we're friends of long, long standing. But he's got the most unassuming, unprepossessing. He'll wear two colored socks. He'll get to the airport, has to phone his wife to find out where he's going. And then he will go in. He has led... He's led more notable people to the Lord. He'll go in to meet some notable person, and all they got to do is look at him once and figure, this bird can't even touch me. And they let their, their, their defenses down, and before you know, he's got them down on their knees, saved and filled with the Spirit. And uh, the Lord used him. She had a philosophy uh, group and used him because uh, as dumb as he sounds, he's as brilliant as they ever come. Used him to lead the new bird to the Lord, and then I'm sure it was he who got her in uh, 700 Club because he's one of the directors of it. And uh, then along comes this man. And Well, you should have heard the story. It was worth the money. But uh, the two of you, when you go places, you should share. Because a lot of people say they no doubt fell in a hole. That's what you know, fell in love, you know. And, uh, and lived, uh, what is it, happily after ever or something like that. It isn't like that at all. Uh, marriage isn't to make you happy, it's to make you more Christ-like, isn't it? And in order to be more Christ-like, you've got to get rid of your problems. How many of you are like me, never had any problems? Yeah, I, I figured, figured quite a few are like me. So when you get married, it's going to be all happiness. Instead of that, as they said, God allows the things in you that could not be brought out under any other circumstance to surface. And then if you really want God, you deal with it. If you don't want God, you use it as an excuse to run. 
One of the great secrets in life is running. If a thing don't suit you, leave. Run. And of course, eventually, where you're going to end up if you start running. God says, stand still. If it kills you, <clears throat> you imagine, stand still and see the glory of God when, when the enemy is right on your back and is going to devour you. You see, if you belong to you, you ought to run. Take my advice, protect yourself, defend yourself, run for all your life, and do all you can. How many of you belong to yourself? Let me see your hands. You're in trouble. How many of you belong to the Lord? Say amen. So if you stand still and get destroyed, what have you lost? What a, if you belong to him and don't belong to yourself and you drop dead, what have you lost? Nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> so may the Lord help all of us to be so committed to him. I remember when I came to Toronto, uh, one lady who used to be in our church spread the good word. says, the Nunes will not stay long with us. He's been an evangelist and he's traveled a long time and traveled around a lot. He won't stay. So I guess, I don't know what she calls long. We've only been here 28 years. And the Lord willing, we'll stay as long as we can. Uh, uh, you, you can't run. My former treasurer said, I figured in two years you'd have a job. I said, I came here to preach and I was prepared to starve to death to preach the gospel. I'd rather preach than eat anyway. <clears throat> you know, you figure things aren't going good, get a job, get something else, do something else, run. Another time he said, the only way we'll make this budget is to somebody rob a bank. Well, we've never robbed a bank, and uh, this church is paid for, uh, we're giving this year $100,000 to missions out of this crowd, and I don't know if we got any millionaires in here or not, but uh, God's people are faithful to do what God wants them to do, and, and you know we put no pressure on you for anything, and I learned something. I said, we came here to stay, we'll stay if we perish. Well, you say, I'd stay too if I lived in as nice a house as you lived in. Yeah, you should have lived in the house we stayed in the first uh, couple of weeks, couple of months. It was so hot that we could barely stand it. So I said, when we move in a house, we'll have air conditioning. My wife doesn't like air conditioning. We got them, we didn't use them too much. And then we stayed in a, in a house where they gave us one glass <clears throat> and uh, uh, very, very limited circumstances. And, and uh, the woman in the house was a little disturbed and followed my wife around and it was terrible, the circumstances we lived in. And then, then our own home, which we had a brand new, beautiful home on the West Coast, fully furnished with all our clothes and everything in it, because when we came east we only brought, you know, clothes in the car, uh, we had it up for sale. And somebody said to the uh, real estate man, give us the key, we want to go and look in it. And they got the key and moved in to live in it. My sister-in-law was driving by and she saw people living in the house, so she phoned us and said, somebody's living in your house. So I picked my wife and two boys up and we drove back to the West Coast. That was our reason to leave. We didn't have a place to live here, just had a handful of people, there was no money, somebody's living back to the house. No, I went back there, we sold the house, I moved my wife and boys to Vancouver and they lived there for that, a year while I lived here in Toronto on Walmer Road. A beautiful, beautiful place I lived in. Nobody talked English in that house. 28 years ago, you never heard English spoken on the streetcar which I traveled on because my wife had the car or in the stores. Every store says, say a blah espanol, you know, parler francais, and, uh, you know, uh, speak German and all that. It, it was all that. And I'm there, and I had this lovely room, and my bed was a, a, a little narrow cot that leaned up against the wall. And I had a shelf on top of it, and I had a little uh, uh, two burner heater and an electric kettle, which his brother gave me, banged up with, with, um, with paint on it. It was good. He said, when we go to work, <clears throat> if we take a new electric kettle, somebody steals it. So he said, we bang it, put paint on it, nobody wants to steal it. <clears throat> and I used to walk <coughs> from Walmer Road <coughs> to um, Broadview, to the Harold Croffel's house, to pick up my mail. And usually it was in the afternoon so they could invite me for supper. <laughs> very very little money for the first couple or three years but we didn't come here for money 
We didn't come here for success. We came here in obedience to the will of God. We could run. I say that because I've watched a lot of people run in 53 years. <clears throat> and then when you try to find them, they're lost to the purposes of God. Of course, if you're not interested in the purposes of God, it doesn't matter what happens to you anyway. If you're not representing Jesus Christ and all he is, you don't count. Have you ever wondered why God said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated? I would have chosen Esau over Jacob. I don't read Esau being crooked. I don't read all the scheming and all the stuff that Jacob did. But uh, Jacob had a heart after God with all of his weaknesses. He, he, he desired the things of God. And the reason God hated Esau, because Esau did not represent God, he didn't represent Jesus Christ, his, his, his whole life never brought glory to God. Whereas through Jacob, there's coming the one who's going to bring redemption. And, and the thing that matters isn't whether you're, what you think is spiritual or holy or rich or powerful or successful. The thing is, does your life reveal Jesus Christ? That's the thing that matters. What's the difference between Ishmael and um, Isaac? Do you know that Ishmael was circumcised the same day as Abraham? Ishmael is Abraham's first son, and in those countries, that puts him right up there with everything. But Ishmael did not represent the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. So God rejected Ishmael, blessed him, made him a father. Was it Esau, a father of dukes, and Ishmael, a father of princes? But they did not represent Jesus Christ. And if your life does not reveal Jesus Christ, you are nothing, you amount to nothing, and you'll have lived in vain. You know, the whole matter of Christianity isn't what experience you have, but whether through that experience Christ is formed in you. The text today is Hebrews 4 and 12. <clears throat> Read it with me. For the Bible is alive. <clears throat> the Word of God. Now, <clears throat> the Word of God is alive. John 1 and 1. Read, tell it to me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The Word is, is a Him. His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. First John chapter 1, quote it with me. That which was from the beginning, which we have see, heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness of that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So, the word of God is who? Jesus Christ. And he said, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. I was thinking about it. <clears throat> All through the book of Revelation, you would think that the first thing you would see is what God really wants you to see. Uh, in the first chapter, John hears a voice behind him saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And he said, I turn to see the voice, and you'd think he'd see the Lord? No. He said, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of it, one like the Son of Man. And, and John in Revelation 19 said, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And then he that sat on him is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written that no man knew but he himself. And his name is called the Word of God. Everybody, the so we're not talking about the Bible now. We're talking about, read it in verse 4, for the word of God is quick. What does quick mean? Alive. Let me hear you say it. The word of God is? What did Jesus say to John on the Isle of Patmos? Fear not, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. The big thing about Jesus is not that he died, but that he rose again. See, they, 
in the book of Acts, they didn't preach the crucifixion. They preached the resurrection. Now, you can have crucifixion without resurrection, but you can't raise anybody from the dead if they're not dead. You can't preach the resurrection without the crucifixion. You know, a lot of people say, I'd like God to raise me from the dead. He can't, not while you're living. You've got to die first. And the message is that Jesus Christ is alive. He who was alive, he who died, is alive forevermore. So the word of God is alive and powerful. Let me hear it. And Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. See, a lot of people think, when I need wisdom, I'll ask the Holy Spirit to give me the word of wisdom. Guess who the word of wisdom is? Jesus Christ. I'll ask the Holy Spirit to give me the power of God. Guess who the power of God is? Jesus Christ. John 16 said the Holy Spirit does not speak on his own initiative. Whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak. He will take the things of mine and reveal it to you. Not his things, things of mine. All that the Father hath is mine. Therefore I said, he will take the things of mine, reveal it to you. I said to the ministers uh, yesterday morning, I've been speaking so many times, different places, I forget where I say it, and, and uh, I said to them, I don't like when I meet a person who says, you know, they're filled with the Spirit, and their first question is, um, which day of the week do you worship in? I said, they may be talking in tongues, but they're not full of the Holy Spirit. Say, how can you tell somebody that's full of the Spirit? Because they jump around and dance. Anybody can jump around and dance. How do I know someone that's full of the Spirit? When the Spirit is come, he will testify of Jesus Christ. He will glorify who? Jesus Christ. So when, when there is the working and moving of the Spirit, you can tell it. The emphasis is in Jesus Christ. How, how do we know what, um, what Joe and Janet tells us is real? Because Joe said... He needed these things out so that the nature of Christ and the gifts of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit, which is of Christ, would be manifested in him. Not that he would adjust his halo and become very spiritual and very holy and go up in the first rapture. That's what a lot of people want. Make me holy, make me wonderful, take me out of this thing. That's not the object. The object is that Jesus Christ will become powerful in our lives. What does it say? Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. What's the power that works in us? Power of the Spirit. And who, who is the Spirit revealing to us as the power of God? Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. So the Word of God, Jesus Christ, is alive and powerful and sharper than two-edged sword. Do you ever notice in Revelation, out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword? I, I don't like that. I, I wish the Bible were a, were a hatchet or a, um, what's the other big thing? An axe. Uh, you know, a hatchet is only sharp on one side. Sharper than any two-edged sword. And what is it doing? It is piercing. The eyes of the Lord in Revelation are like a flame of fire, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Uh, how can you tell whether Jesus Christ is really present? Uh, someone said this morning, Gloria, the Lord is present. How can you tell whether Jesus is really present? Because there begins to come a division between soul and spirit. That's, that's when the Word of God is present. It, it does that. When, when the Word of God is not operating, you can have a lot of soulish stuff, which is more spiritual than spiritual stuff. A lot of natural soulish thing, which is more enthusiastic than the real spiritual thing, which is more, uh, not compassionate, but sympathetic uh, than the real spiritual thing. But when the Word of God is there, there always comes a division. I never forget Father McDougall spoke to us and uh, the ministers and he said the, the Bible says that uh, uh, the, unto you is born the Prince of Peace and Jesus said I am not come to send peace on the earth I'm come to send a sword I'm come to bring division and every time and, and frankly I must tell you from my humanity that's one thing I have never liked about the gospel 
When I preached for Youth for Christ, I was invited to all the Baptist, Presbyterian. When I'd come to town, they all wanted me to come and preach for them on Sunday. <clears throat> when I'd go and preach, and I'd preach a salvation message, I never preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a Presbyterian, Anglican, United, Baptist, or any of the churches. Because I know what happens. The moment you begin to bring Jesus Christ into focus afresh, you've got division. You've got trouble. When Christ was here on earth, there, there was a dividing. Because immediately, the soul and the spirit. You know, in Galatians we studied, and we're going to study uh, another couple of weeks in Galatians. It said, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that's born after the spirit. You want to know whether you're after the spirit? If you're a persecutor, you're not born after the spirit. You're born after the flesh. That's a simple thing. There's a division that comes immediately, and the word of God does that. The presence of the Lord pierces right down into the inner sanctum of the being, the soul and spirit, and is a, read it, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Ever notice about Jesus, it said, Jesus knew their thoughts. That's one of the terrible things. I, uh, uh, in the days of visitation a number of years ago, uh, when I was moving in that realm, I could look a crowd over and think, know exactly what everybody was thinking. I knew exactly what anybody's problems were. i never forget, when I went to the church out west, where I pastored for several years, uh, they thought, you know, when I came to town, I'd be a firebrand and, uh, you know, turn things loose. And I just got up and I spoke to them like I usually preach. And the elders in that church were horrified. They thought when I came, I'd stand and my head swing from the chandelier. And, uh, and I just get up. And then I invited people to come forward uh, for prayer. I'd never seen the people before. And I just never asked anybody what's wrong with them. Just laid my hands on them and just prayed everything that was wrong with them. I can still hear the leading elders say, my God, how does he know? You know, they, they discovered that the working of the Spirit is not in a lot of noise and a lot of hoopla and a lot of propaganda, but that there's a reality. When the Word of God comes, it discerns the very thoughts and intents of the heart. And, and it said about Christ, he knew their thoughts. He knew what was in man. And Jesus Christ is alive today and he knows everything that's in us. You know, we think we can hide it under, um, I, I never forget, I was praying for several hundred young people in a long line, and all of a sudden, one fellow got so blessed, when I laid hands on him, he started to dance in the aisle. I called one of the preachers over, I said, go and find out what he's covering up. We think if we dance, or shout loud enough, or jump high enough, or make enough profession, you, can, you can't cover, there's nothing hidden from the eyes of the Lord. And verse 13, read it. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his. You see, he's talking about the word of God as a hymn. By him were all things made. Without him is nothing made. Nothing is hid that is not manifest in his sight. Verse, continue, but all things are naked. How many of you people know what naked means? Naked means you've got no clothes on. Naked has to do with the exterior, but not only naked and opened. That means a penetration on the inside. See, most of the time we think as long as we keep the exterior all right, you know, the Lord sees what it is. But he sees more than the things that are visible on the outside. He sees the thoughts, the intents, right down into the innermost recesses of our being. And uh, that's how the judgment will come. All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's why Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, you look wonderful outside, but you're rotten inside. He said, you make the outside of the cup clean so that there's nothing apparently wrong, but inside is all kinds of beauty, uh, evil and wickedness and the rest of that. And, and God wants not only that we be clean exteriorly, but we be clean in the interior. He wants to get at our heart, our motives, our intentions, our purposes. And then in verse 14 it says, He is our great high priest. Read verse 13 again with me. Well, 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick or alive and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. That's pretty, pretty close when you start separating joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. For all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him who is dwelling in heaven. The eyes of him with whom we have to do. Uh, in other words, your best, best uh, action is have nothing to do with him. Because if you do, if you do, he's going to penetrate into the innermost recesses of your being. He's going to separate that which is soulish, carnal, fleshly, egotistical, self-building, and all the rest of that from that which is Christ-exalting. He's going to deal with every facet of your life and bring victory and bring triumph because it's him with whom we have to do. It's, uh, if you're dealing with God, he's going to be powerful, He's going to be alive, he's going to discern, he's going to search. And uh, the trouble is, oftentimes, <clears throat> it's like Joe said this morning, God used his wife to reveal to him the problems. Now, most of us would be very happy if the archangel Gabriel were sent from heaven. This is Christmas time, remember the angel came and said, Thus saith the Lord through me, to you and he's shining bright you got a problem you'd say oh God help me <clears throat> and you want to get rid of the problem so later you can brag that it was Gabriel himself whom God used to deliver me of a problem but if it's your wife or your husband that brings out the worst in you how many of you know who brings out the worst in us I can name them for you Hitler Mussolini Stalin and Mao Zedong those four fellas, I tell you, who brings out the worst in you? Your husband, your wife, your children, your closest friends, your family. <coughs> hmm? And, and, and who, who does God use? Who does God use? Yes, his people. Uh, one, one of the problems people have oftentimes they come to church and somebody says to them, how are you? And immediately they're hurt. They're asking me, how am I? Or if they miss church, uh, how many of you notice when you miss church, 99 and 44% of the time I never ask you why you miss? Because people get mad if you ask them. People miss church a little while, two or three people come and say, I missed you. Right away their feelings are hurt. So I try not to hurt people's feelings. Would you please thank me for that? <clears throat> but you know that's serious business because no one can help you until you're ready to be helped. I know I'm getting older, uh, not by the calendar, but by myself. When I was younger, I was going to help everybody, I'm going to tell everybody what to do. You can't tell anybody what to do. You can't. You hear the way I'm preaching? You think I'm out here to tell you? I can't tell you anything. If God isn't telling you in the first place, if you aren't responding to the Spirit, when I'm through preaching, well, it was either a good sermon, bad sermon, or you didn't hear it. it. Don't mean a thing. That's why when I shake hands with you at the door, and when I go home, I'm not all uptight. I say to my wife, do you think they accepted the message? Do you think anybody liked it? That's not my business. My business, I declare the word, if you are having to do with him. If you're having to do, then the word will be alive to you. If you're not having to do with him, it's dead becomes a letter. What on earth did I bother coming to church for? I should have stayed in bed. I mean, he never said a thing that... Uh, I didn't hear anything. Of course you don't. The Word of God's not alive because you're not dealing with Him. If you have to do with Him, if you're walking in fellowship with Him, He will reveal Himself to you as alive. Amen? As powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of everything that's soulish, or spiritual, and so on. Now, uh, Sister um, Gerald, how many people do we have that want to be baptized now? 
How many? About three or four. How long ago, have you been baptized in water? How long ago? Yes. Nine years ago. How long have you, hmm? Five? Show me on your fingers. Yeah. Six months after you're saved. The Bible says, repent and be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized. Now, a lot of people say, I don't need to be baptized because I was christened. <clears throat> Unless you were a heathen of some kind, most of the people in Canada were christened. So we've spent a lot of money <clears throat> getting a baptismal tank for nothing. How many of you were christened as babies? Let me see your hand. Okay, that solves it. Didn't solve it for me, because it says, He that believeth and is baptized. Not he that is baptized and then believes 30 years later. It's he that believeth and is baptized. And John preached baptism of repentance, and the people came to him. And Jesus, you should read John's Gospel, chapter 2 and 3 and 4, how Jesus himself were baptizing many people. Not himself, but his disciples for him. In fact, his disciples baptized more people than John the Baptist. Then on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, repent and be baptized, was the message. And when Paul got converted, who was a very good Jew, he said, uh, why tarriest thou uh, be baptized? And he that believeth and is baptized should be saved. And many people, I was saved for a number of years and was not baptized because my parents were not in favor of it. But at the first opportunity I had, 1930, the last day of December, I was baptized in water in Evangel Temple, when Evangel Temple was downtown, in an act of obedience. You see, what is water baptism? Not the practice of the church. I mean, it, we don't believe in bap water baptism because Faith Temple believes in it. I, for, the, for the life of me, I don't even know what Faith Temple believes. We, 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 uh, we, be we practice it because the Bible says so. And when Jesus came to be baptized of John, John said, I should be baptized of you. And Jesus said, suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So there are others of you who need to be baptized. You should speak to Sister Gerald. She asked me to make the announcement. And one of these days we'll have a water baptismal service. Now you do not become a member of Faith Temple by being baptized here. If that was so, we'd have maybe 400 uh, members in the church. We used to baptize all the people from the catacombs the first few years. They'd come here, our son Jim, who was ordained, would baptize them in water. I think the only person we got out of the catacombs was, uh, what's your name? Yes, uh, he accepted the Lord when I spoke, came here, he was baptized in water, he stayed. So, so water baptism doesn't join you to the church, but it's, you're baptized into his death. It brings you into a closer, more vital relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think a lot of us are saying to ourselves, why don't I make further progress spiritually? Because progress is made on that terrible word, obedience. Everybody say it. It's almost as bad as the word when you want to take music, practice. <laughs> but, uh, the two words are almost as bad as each other. But let's ask the Lord. Lord, search our hearts. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that the Word of God is here today, the even Jesus Christ, the living Word, and that as we have to do with him, there's nothing hidden. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Pray that you'll search all of our hearts and do a work in us that will bring glory and praise to thee. Work out that obedience in us that will bring glory to thy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you need to receive Christ as your Savior, we invite you to come forward. If you need prayer, we invite you to come forward. Let's stand as we sing. Search me.
The next verse is, O Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival, start the work in me. Thy word declares thou wilt supply the need for blessings now, O Lord, we humbly pray. As we sing it, I'm going to ask Colonel, Pat Colonel Patterson to come to the platform to dismiss us in prayer. Remember tonight I'm speaking on the God of love and peace. Oh, 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 oh.